my taste with Babendum wine. Demystifying wine, one sip at a time. Hello from Nigel Williams and welcome to our programme that looks at food and drink from the perspective of chefs, wine experts and restaurant owners. Today I'm talking to Thomasina Myers, who famously won MasterChef in 2005 and since then has launched her own highly successful Mexican restaurant chain, Oaxaca. Thomasina, welcome. 2005. Now it's a long time ago, isn't it? But what's your lasting memory of appearing in MasterChef? Um... Probably fear. <laughs> <laughs> I um, funny enough, I was talking. I was talking to about three hundred school children last week, and um, I think that's the that was probably a, the greatest thing that you take away from that experience is kind of living with that kind of pit of fear churning around your stomach, mm. and learning how to deal with it. So um, quite good, you know, stands you in good stead, that kind of thing. That wasn't your. I mean, it was earlier in life when you actually got the bug for for cooking, wasn't it? It was the the Mexico experience. Yeah, I mean, actually, I loved cooking from you know right from the word go. I was kind of in the kitchen with my mother, trying to learn all the secrets of what she was doing with flour and emulsions and mayonnaises and white sauces. But yeah, the Mexico thing happened when I was 18. I went off after after a, a grueling nine months being a VAT, VAT consultant. Um, with the money they kind of sent me off with, I went around Mexico and Central America and um, discovered this incredible cuisine in Mexico, which I didn't know existed. Indeed, because for, for most of us, it's the Tex-Mex experience, isn't it? And that's not Mexican. So at the start of your uh, chain of restaurants, which we'll come on to in more detail a bit later, that must have been the real challenge, really, was to say to customers, actually, this is Mexican. Yeah. I mean, when we started nine years ago, it was exactly that. When I talked to peers of mine who work in Michelin style kitchens, they literally looked at me like I was mad, going, Tommy, Mexican but it's disgusting. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, no. Actually, for me, the easiest way to tell people about Mexican is the similarities with Italy in terms of regionality, because you've got 32 states, you've got all these different cuisines um, uh, within Mexico. But then the other thing which is really easy to grasp is biodiversity. So Mexico is in the top five countries in the world in terms of biodiversity. So all you have to do is transport yourself to one of those markets in Mexico mm -hmm. and you see this incredible range of produce. Let's go back to MasterChef just briefly. Is it like, because it was 2005 that you were the winner, and I was just looking at the list there, it was called MasterChef Goes Large at that point. <laughs> you know, yes. Goes Large. That puts it very into a certain era, doesn't it? But... Uh, are you part of some kind of alumni? Yeah, I mean, every year we go back and we judge on the current series. So we get to catch up and, and, and hang out. And it's it's really lovely seeing. I mean, I was such an early series that I don't have that same camaraderie with, say, the guys who came out five, six, seven years ago. Yeah. Because they all started doing the machine had really started by then so they're all yeah. doing good food shows together and stuff like that um and then of course by that time i'd open Oaxaca, so i was fairly busy doing that but they're a really great um gang and yeah we've got this shared common experience of living through <laughs> this terrifying experience <laughs> uh john Tarot and greg wallace called you bold and eccentric um, why do you think? Well, I ran into Greg the other day in a restaurant and he, he still thinks I'm eccentric. So I'm not sure where he gets that from. <laughs> Probably the use of ingredients, they think. So I'm really into seasons and, and British ingredients and all that. But I do love a bit of spice. Take a few spices and a few chilies from around the world and use them to add exciting touches to food. In the early series... I would have loved to have done it. Now I'd be too scared. Do you think the level of, uh, has gone up? It's a complete different thing now because it's gained such momentum and is such a huge programme yeah, worldwide. Uh, people who auditioned to go on it have been practising for months and months. You know, people have been food blogging for a couple of years before they go on. I mean, there's all sorts of... It's a completely different thing. I mean, I do still remember the night before my final dish, getting my flatmate to teach me how to make ravioli, which I was then going to cook the next day. So, um, yeah, I mean, nowadays, I think people practice that final dish 30 times over. Yeah. So it's definitely a different thing. OK, so off the back of winning in 2005, it would be easy for us to make that mental leap of going, oh, so she won that, she's been on TV, she gets to open up a chain of restaurants just like that. Surely it didn't happen like that. How did it happen? 
Uh, so after MasterChef, uh, the, winning it was really extraordinary because I had a catalogue of failures in my life kind of leading up to that moment. Uh, so it was a very uh, invigorating uh, thing for me to have won and someone, Greg and John Bay, saying, yes, we believe in you, you're good enough to do this. I went and got a job working for Sky Gingell at Peacham Nursery straight after, um, which she ga- later gained a Michelin star in. Um, and it, that's where seasonality, surely, that must have, you must have really, because that was famous for that. We it? were in a kitchen garden. So in the mornings I would go, whether it was sunshine in the summer or depths of winter, I would be out picking herbs or, you know, courgette flowers in the, in, in the summer, radicchio in the winter. Like, it was really incredible experience um, to see those ingredients coming in. So that was great. Um, I... At some point I left and I remember my business partner approaching me. He had this idea um, and I said, look, why don't you come to Mexico? Because I've got some great places because I went and lived there um, for a year. Uh, and I said, you know, the food is extraordinary there. I think we could do something really fun. We went out and we ate more than we could possibly fit <laughs> for for 10 days. I mean, we came back feeling so ill with the amount of food we'd eaten. <laughs> um, and we said, let's go for it. And it took us a year to kind of hone the menu, find a site. That was the hardest thing, finding a site. In those days before the recession, it was virtually impossible yeah. if you were independent um, with no track record to mm. find a site. So it took us a long time. But then we opened. The only site we could find was um, an old Irish pub, which we um, took all the walls, which had been stained with kind of decades of puke, <laughs> stripped it down and um, and built this restaurant. And, and, you know, we had this queue. We had this crazy queue that snaked, you know, out the door around the block. We had that queue for three or four years, um, really, until we opened two more central London sites, which eased off the pressure, which was a really incredibly affirming thing for us. <laughs> How important is um, the drinks that you sell around your food to you as the as the chef and owner? Well, I mean, I I adore alcohol. Um, I I try not to drink too much of it. I, I get you know, I, it doesn't affect me very well if I drink it every day. So I definitely you know don't drink it every day. But I love it. I love the nuances of it. I love the way you know a whiskey can make me feel like I'm coming home at the beginning of the evening a delicious red wine um, and then particularly in terms of um, Mexico tequila and mezcal are two of my favourite spirits I've got to learn more and more about them over the years and they are such pure drinks um, you know we only stock 100% agave tequilas in our restaurants and they are completely different things to the tequilas that we used to drink ten more than 10 years ago oh, okay so for those who've had a bad experience with tequila should go along to one of yours and say i'll have a tequila and it will be it's a completely different thing and particularly with tequila it's the most uplifting drink you can possibly imagine i mean like nothing else it gets a party going it is such a fun drink and it doesn't give you a hangover at all uh how about uh mexican beer are you a fan of mexican beers i love beers i love um i love ales i love going to a pub in in england and getting you know a kind of dark ale not a kind of pale lager mm. not really a stout although i like stout at certain times mm. but i love like real ales um and some of those beers in mexico are quite ale like um mm. so there are these great similarities actually mm. um so yeah i like i like beer think about mexican cuisine and you're a chili expert I'm wondering how those chilies go with, say, for instance, a, a wine choice. What do you would, would you advise people to choose around the kind of dishes that you get in Oaxaca? Yeah, so um, you know, normally with food, I try and um, stick to the kind of similar regions because it seems to make sense. The terroir, so um, you know, New World wines typically um, for New World flavors. Um, so a lot a lot of people think that Mexican food is just fiery hot, which also is not true. Mm-hmm. So some of the salsas are quite spicy, yeah. but a lot of the kind of braised meats and fishes are just very aromatic. They use spices like cinnamon and cloves and fresh herbs, oregano, thyme, mint, um, coriander, um, but not so spicy. But then when that spice does kick in, you know, m- more full-bodied wines, wines that can have, with a bit of spice in them, if you're talking white, um, that not completely dry, that kind of off dry, but, but bodied, but still, I mean, still dry. I wouldn't say a medium, um, but just with that kind of 
not like a Sauvignon, more like a kind of Viognier or, or something with a bit more roundedness and fruit in it. it it's great fun matching, actually, um, matching the food with wine. And a lot of the wine does go very well. Let's talk about some of your choices. I think, um, yeah, one of the newspaper articles I read about you says you lead a bohemian lifestyle in North London. Uh, <laughs> where do you... Yeah, that was probably pre-kids uh, where do you go With locally <laughs> <laughs> where do we go locally so yeah. um we're really lucky we've got the so the dot kitchen is on our doorstep which is owned um by a friend of mine called stevie Paul, who i met at cooking school and he won the observers young chef of the year a couple of years ago um he's got another restaurant called rotorino in east london and he's just opening a restaurant in Greenwich. Um, and it's, it, the dock has really wonderful food. And you can just go and have, you know, a starter or a main course. And they make incredible flatbreads that they come out of the baked mm-hmm. ovens. So that that's kind of lovely to have on your doorstep. I mean, we've got curry houses and, you know, Thai takeaways too. But the dock's lovely for kind of popping into just getting one plate of delicious food. Are you the sort of person who has to get away from London occasionally? And if if you did... Where would you go to that was out there somewhere? I think um, when we get out of town, we love Wales. Um, in fact, we just opened a Oaxaca in Cardiff, uh, which is our first one outside of the southeast. And uh, it's just it's a it's a country that's really coming up with food. The ingredients are extraordinary. Um, uh, little kind of um, B and Bs like the Felon Fat Griffin is incredible. Um, the Walnut Tree um, and the Hardwick and Ambergavenny are great. Now Chef- you've mentioned them, you won't be able to get in now. <laughs> I know. Well, also, I mean, Simon Wright also is a lovely guy who we met last time we were on a holiday there who's just opened a new place and and these are guys who are really making use of welsh produce and and it's just it's it's great country now you um you say you do uh, the occasional shift in one of your restaurants yeah what would you say is your signature dish then as a professional so we um we have a dish called a pork pibil taco which is a specialty of the yucatan in mexico um which is essentially um pork sh- sh- uh, shoulder and collar which we marinate for 24 hours and then we slow cook over five hours and it comes out um it's redolent with all these wonderful spices and herbs it's not at all hot no chilies in there uh and then um and then we serve it with these pink pickled onions, which are red onions marinated in fresh orange and fresh lime. And it's a really, I mean, people just go mad for it. It's kind of soft and unctuous and full of flavour. And um, yeah, it's pretty good. If I were visiting uh, Mexico, because many people are going there for, for their holidays now, how easy is that to get? Because you go to your international hotel it's going to be international cuisine yeah well, how far do you have to go to be able to get this stuff well th- that particular dish is um if you go to the yucatan you will find it in any street market and i would tell anyone going to mexico to never go near an international hotel's restaurant and to try and eat on the in the markets and on the street as much as possible because that's where you find the really extraordinary food and the food really is so good and um and the street food particularly Okay, now let's talk about, a, say, a special occasion. Maybe if you're going out with your husband, Mark, you know, it's your birthday or whatever. Where would you choose for that very special occasion? Well, I'm qu- quite biased because I've been going to the River Cafe for special occasions for years. And it's still, you know, when I walk into that dining room, it just makes me feel like a million dollars. It's for real treats. It's for definitely for treats, not for kind of every other day. But for those treats where you really save up and want a special occasion, the food is extraordinary and um, and the dining room is glamorous and sexy and you just feel like a million dollars the moment you walk in. Do you wish you'd worked there in your earlier career? Well, I did actually work there for a day as a waitress uh, just before I got the job offer to go and open a cocktail bar in Mexico City. So I think I was the shortest serving member on their payroll. I don't think I even made payroll, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, well, what might have been. Now, Oaxaca, you've spoken about uh, at length, but would you like to, I know you have your, your food writing to do, of course, would you like to add another brand? Is there something else that you would like to run? Well, I mean, I, I could, you know, I make, chili, um, I write books as well. So I've just written a book, um, Chili Notes, all on chilies, but everyday recipes. That's fun. I, I do love the food writing. We've got some sauces that we sell in the supermarkets, which is fun. Um We've got a new restaurant called DF Mexico, which we open in Shoreditch, which is a bit like a kind of Mexican, Californian cantina style. Mm. I mean, it's really fun 
and cool and it's a it's a bit more lighthearted than Oaxaca we call it the cheeky younger brother um or the cheeky younger sister so that's really fun I guess with my business partner and I we never stop coming up with mad ideas we're taking over the roundhouse in November for a big day of the dead event so we've got lots going on and um I'm we're in a very lucky position to be doing something we really love let's um set aside the chilies and uh Open the chiller because you've uh, chosen us the dessert wine. So we're going to taste that right now. My taste with the Bendham wine. So, Tommy, I'm really looking forward to your choice because it's a dessert wine. And a lot of people skip over that, don't they? They get to the pudding bit and they think, yeah, I don't want to do sweet wine. But actually, it's a whole world. It's a whole world. And I think, you know, forget about all these very very sweet sickly wines of yesteryear the wines the pudding wines you can get now are so complex and so delicious but with that lovely sugariness that it's just a treat it's like a jewel at the end of the meal Mm -hmm. you know you're having a glorious piece of tart with a crusty crispy pastry buttery and and with some wonderful fruit inside and then someone gives you a glass of this golden liquid and it is it's just it's the perfect way to round up and one of these things that is more likely to be in a half bottle and uh, you said your your tip was not to have too much yeah i mean for me one glass is all you really want otherwise you are at risk of feeling really sorry for yourself the next day but if you limit yourself to a glass i mean it makes an amazing present a half bottle of pudding wine which you keep in the fridge until you you know you have the right occasion to bring it out it just really rounds off uh, a, a meal and and for me the greatest pleasure in life is to have friends or family around for for many hours of eating and drinking it's just a glorious way to spend time and if you can round it off one of these pudding wines now i know that we have an alternative to your original suggestion what was your original suggestion well, the chateau Yquem, which is just a renownedly kind of so turn delicious i mean there are all sorts of pudding wines you were talking about um wines from eastern europe there's some incredible ones so you've really got different classifications of pudding wines you've got some like this um so turn from the Jurassic region, which are um, kind of white wine origin. They're kind of gold and amber coloured. Um, uh, they they somehow managed to be dry and sweet at the same time. Um, and then you've got the more raisiny types of wines um, from Eastern Europe. Um, the sherries also are really incredible, yes. which are which kind of maybe go with puddings that are a bit more Mm -hmm. full-bodied chocolatey puddings um, I mean the wine that we're going to taste now is great with kind of apricot tarts or or gooseberry fools or things like that Um, but you've also got red wines as well now that are really kind of complex quite dry for pudding wine but punchy and incredible Uh, now so this uh, Jurançon in the uh, one of these lesser known regions of France and predicted to really take off in 2015 because this idea of going for things which aren't so famous and yet you know the locals have been enjoying for for generations let's have a little sniff of this and um, see what uh, yeah what we've got in here this is uh, the man called Hape Symphonie de Novembre mm. that's delicious I mm. mean those those fruity apricot I mean it, it smells it smells like you want to dive into it immediately. Yeah, and it's, it does have that, that edge, doesn't it? That nice cutting edge of that, mm. that apricot, as you mentioned there. Just. So high acidity in this. Wow, that's ever so fresh. Mm. It's just delicious. It's just delicious. So just picture you've had a, del- a wonderful meal with, with great friends and you've had the main course and you've had quite a lot of red wine. You think, well, maybe I should stop now. I've had quite a lot of wine and I don't want any more. And then someone just gives you a small glass of this to round off your meal with whatever pudding you're having. And you just feel that life is treating you well. Life is good. The great variety here, Petit Mansang. Um, wow. And that's native to, to the region. So yeah. they obviously know how to make wine out of this grape. And as you said, it's light. It's kind of zippy for a pudding wine. It's just really doesn't feel too, you know, nothing, nothing sickly or heavy mm. or syrupy really about this. It's, it's, it's fresh and yeah. great. I'm actually blown away by that. I, I'm, I'm not just saying that. I, I am. And I think it's also because we're in here at the stage of like, we haven't had anything else. Mm. 
So it hasn't been the meal or anything. Let's see, your taste buds absolutely heightened yeah, for this. Yeah, really This wonderful. is lovely. Yeah. And the surprise to this is about £15 for half a bottle of this. Yeah, and exactly. So that's it. You buy them in half bottles. Um, so this is a really good quality wine, um, but it's not going to break the bank. You don't need more than half a bottle. And as I said, great present. Bring it around to someone's and, you know, it's just, just wonderful. Always have one in the fridge for that special occasion. Well, keep coming back. You've got so much of a story to tell and so much has happened in a very short space of time, relatively. So, uh, Thomasina Myers, thanks very much. Come and see us. Thanks. My Taste with Babendum Wine. Find out more about the flavours you like and discover something new by downloading Babendum's free app. Search Plonk in your app store.